I'm going to talk about Blurm, which I call a database, but I don't really know what a database is. Database just sounds like a fancy word, so I call it a database. But first, I'm going to talk about me, because someone said I should talk about me. Uh, I've been using Python for about 10 years, and right now I'm like traveling around, but not sightseeing. I was just in Sweden, and I, I realized that I really that there's some really nice nature in Sweden, but they don't have electrical outlets, and I, I wanted my computers. And that there's kind of a theme here, that's why I'm going to a conference or other, I don't know looking at old churches or something. Uh, so, yeah, um, although I, I am getting a bit tired of, of uh, traveling, so I, I might be in the mood for a job pretty soon. And, and, um, anyway, this is my first Python conference. I thought it was kind of odd that I hadn't been to one, so that's, I just look for Python conferences. And, yeah, so, um, and like what I, what I do all day, I really like, I, I, I'm a, I'm a big into Dada. So here's a spreadsheet that I made on Letterpress. This is an example of like ridiculous Dada. I can actually show you the, the, the real thing. Well, you know, I'll show you later. I don't feel like getting it out. But it's, uh, I, you know, Gutenberg, that, that thing, that, the thing that he made, that's letterpress. It's metal type. It's like 500 years old. So before they had computers, this is the way they made computer files. They printed it out on letterpress. Uh, I, I, maybe the joke isn't coming across because nobody's laughing. <laughs> Does, do you get it? No, maybe I have to explain it later. No, no, it's 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 older than that. It's uh, it's I put ink on metal type and then I press press it against some paper, uh, and it's a CSV file, you know, computer readable. Anyway, I'm spending too much time on this. Another ridiculous thing is um, this is a music synthesizer in a spreadsheet. You use spreadsheet functions to compose your music, and then you call the sheet music function and you generate the sheet music. And this red uh, thing and this red thing, they're the same data represented as spreadsheet and sheet music. You can also generate songs, of course, with it. Um, but that's enough data for now. Once in a while, I do some data because data doesn't pay any money. And uh, so it's like you get some data from some place and make some model or whatever. And yeah, and probably use the data in some way completely different from what was originally intended. And the relevant part here is the acquiring data step sometimes involves me going to some external website that I do not trust at all to keep functioning, and uh, I have to store those data, and that, you'll see, is related to why I have this library, Learn. So, I made Learn because I really like ordinary files, just like you have your directory and you look and it has files in it, but um, accessing files in Python is, oh yeah, see, so I can just use ls and, and I, I see my files, um, but accessing f files in Python is very verbose. This is actually quite nice because we have these very low level APIs and we can um, tune our system to be very optimized to whatever thing we want, but it's very verbose, and that's the disadvantage of having these low-level APIs. So here's a, an example of how we access files in Python, um, a simple way, you know, we, we write to a file on the top, we read from the file on the bottom, and this is kind of long, um, and it doesn't have a lot of features that I would really like to have, like dealing with incomplete writes, or serializing to different formats like JSON, or um, handling directory, like naming our files uh, that have slashes and stuff like that. And adding all this, it gets very verbose, and I wanted something that would do all that for me so I could write something simpler, and, and uh, that's Blurm. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to tell you today how Blurm works, um, how I use it, how it relates to my approach to testing and debugging, um, when you should use other things instead, and some interesting parts of the implementation that don't really have anything to do with Blurm. Um, yeah. So, uh, so first, how it works, which really is like how you use it. Um, you install it from IPI with pip. It should work in Python 2 and Python 3, but I normally develop in Python 3. Um, and basically, it's a, it's a dictionary at its core. It's like a dictionary. It, it's a dict-like object. So you, uh, you call this, you, you instantiate a learn object, and you give it a directory, and all your data gets stored in that directory. And this resulting learn object is a dict-like um, so you can set it to be equal to something, and when you do this, um, internally it's uh, dumping the, the object as a pickle to the file. So we said Vorm file name, and the directory of the Vorm was temp a directory, so the result is that the file gets saved to this file name, and we can open it with ordinary pickle. Um, and it's a dictionary type object, so we can do all the ordinary dictionary operations, um, and like reading from a from a key, reads the file, deleting, deletes the file, uh, and you can you know, do all those other things. Um, the point is that it just acts like a dictionary, 
but it accesses files in a very simple way and it produces a very meaningful file structure. So if my program disappears or I forget how to use it or someone else is reading it, um, then I still have the data and I can figure out what's going on. Um, there, are two, there are a bunch of parameters that you can initialize the form with, but the two most important ones to mention are you can set what I call a serializer and what I call a key transformer, and I'm going to define those now. A uh, serializer, by default, um, it uses pickle, as I mentioned, but you can change it to do something else. So uh, here I change it to do JSON, and then what happens is when I write to this needle file, the value is T-R-U-E, the JSON representation of uh, true. Am I going too fast? Okay, cool. Um, so that's, that's a serializer. You just, it has to have a dump and a load method, and they do like what they would in, in JSON. Um, and there are more in this module. And then the transformers, the other main thing to concern yourself with, um, they are for determining how a key should be mapped to a file name. So the example I've been showing is if I give it just a string needle, then needle is going to become like needle in the current directory, or that's since needle from the root of the, the learn. So we said this learn is associated with this directory, so this directory slash needle. Um, but what if we give it something weird like it has a slash in it, or it's a tuple of strings, or it's a date? Well, the, the, the default is to use what I call the magic transformer that just figures out something reasonable. Um, so in this case, the slash gets turned into a, a, a slash. Um, the, the tuple gets turned into subdirectories, so with slashes in between, or backslashes of windows. Uh, and the date gets split into year, month, day. But uh, maybe you don't want all this magic, uh, so you might choose to use a different transformer, such as what I call the slash transformer, which allows you to pass strings as keys with slashes, and slashes will break directories, but anything else will give you an error. So here we have this slash here that turns into a directory, but um, the tuple will give you an error. And there are, again, more in Lorem.transformers. Uh, so, so far I've been telling you how Vorm works, and I focus on these three aspects, that it, there's this diff-like blurb object, and there's the transformers and serializers. There's one more main component to talk about, which is um, what I call cache, but it's not quite the right word. Um, so this is, uh, this started because when I first made early version of Vorm, I found myself doing this a lot. I would write a function that would do something, and then it would check if the key that I was computing something for was already stored in my Vorm. And if it was, it would return the value from the blurb, and otherwise it would do something that was very expensive and save that value to the blurb and then return it. So here is, I wanted to avoid running the same function twice, so I was using blurb as a cache. Um, and I kept writing this, so I figured I should factor that out, and that's this blurb.cache decorator. Um, I won't explain too much the details, but it mostly, you just decorate your function, you can give it parameters, and uh, it'll do what you saw on the previous slide. So here I. Uh, this, this function doesn't, it just returns what you give it as input, but the first time we, or when you run it, it prints something. And thus, when I run it a few times, you can see the first time we run it with the particular arguments, it prints this is running for the first time, but the second time, it doesn't actually run the function because it's already cached the result. And uh, thus, we don't have the print. Um, so that's the, uh, yeah, you, you can pass it the usual verb arguments, so I can set a different transformer, for example. I'm setting a different transformer. Um, okay, uh, so I've told you a lot about how Vlorm works, and I'm going to keep talking about other things that I said I would talk about, but now I'm going to talk about briefly something that I didn't say I would talk about. Uh, does anyone know what the two hard things in computers are? Naming things. That's one of them. Naming things is cache, one of them. What's the other one? Cache validation. Cache and validation, right. Uh, the two hard things are cache and validation and naming things. And I've addressed both of these in Vlorm. First of all, cache and validation. I actually haven't addressed it. I just said, you know, we're not going to invalidate the caches ever. Um, more importantly, uh, I've addressed naming things because I managed to come up with a name for this library. And here's how I come up with names. As I said, I'm really into Dada, and I learned that the Dadas like to make up words. So, so I started doing that. I name my libraries by pounding on the keyboard like this. And you can see I use the Dvorak keyboard, which looks like this. And so the, now let's, put, let's look at the Vlurm letters. It seems that this day that I was naming the library Vlurm, my right hand was more uh, fast than my left hand, so so we got the, the, the you know the right side. So, yeah. so uh, anyway, that's that's where the name come from. You can pronounce it however you like, but I just tried to 
I try to tweak the name so that they're sort of pronounceable. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so I said we're going to talk about how um, Learn works, and next we're going to talk about how I use it. Then I'm going to talk about yeah, the other things, but how I use it. Um, so usually I use the cache decorator, and the simplest of functions I'll have is something that downloads a web page, um, and it takes the URL as the key, um, and then it just returns using the request library. Um, and then I can make the same request twice, and it's it's not actually making the same request twice. It's using the cached version from before. Um, so this way, I, I don't have to worry that the site changes, or if the site uh, if something breaks, I can see why it broke. Uh, and uh, now that I'm doing this, it starts to become natural to test and debug things in a certain way. So the first thing is I can very easily inspect the inputs or the outputs of these functions. Um, so let's say uh, let's say I got an error in a function, and I can tell that the uh, the error was a result of a response that was downloaded. And I can figure out that this learn is the thing that contains the, uh, the thing that's causing the error. So I can just open it, and I can say, well, let's look at um, value number 461, which was the thing that was causing the error, and I can see what's going on there. And this is relevant. Let's say it's uh, something that runs every night, and it broke yesterday, and I need to figure out what's going on. I have the full, all the information about the response there, and I can debug it. And then once I've debugged it and figured out what's going on, I can also just copy it into my um, fixtures directory as a, as a mock. So uh, is this big enough? OK, good. So, uh, so here, th let's say this is in my test file. I can say I'm going to open up this web page that I uh, copied from the blurm into my fixtures directory. And we're going to load it, because it's just a pickle. Um, and then I can run my function and test that it does what I thought it would do. And this was the thing that produced the error before, so I can check that every time I get an error in my code, I can copy the thing that was causing the error, and I can write some code that fixes it, and then when the test passes, I'm good. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's a cool thing about having everything safe like this. Um, another neat thing about testing this is uh, usually I use it through the cache decorator, but sometimes I use it as a as actually as a dictionary. And uh, if you do this, it becomes a your entire your entire database is a dictionary, so I can we'll get to that. So here's a function that I'm going to run on the database. Uh, it doesn't really matter what it does, but uh, it takes the database and a couple other things. Um, and then we're going to here's how we might call it. We have a learn here, and we're going to pass it some arguments. Uh, but when we're testing it, I don't want to I don't want to initialize this, initialize this learn because that's going to create a bunch of files and that'll be slow and it could cause some difficulty and it might just take um, more code. So instead, I can just mock my entire database as a bunch as a, as a dictionary, and I can pass that because the Learn API is the same as the dictionary. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's go again over what we've talked about so far. I have told you about how Learn works, like installing it and stuff, how I use it, how it changes my testing and debugging, and next I'm going to tell you when to use other things instead. So the the nice things about Learn are. Uh, that it serializes Python objects pretty easily and stores them to files. It produces meaningful file names in your file system so that if I forget how my program works, I can still figure out what the data is doing. Um, it, it, uh, it'll compose directories nicely if, if you want to have subdirectories. And it's, it's a database, whatever that means, but it doesn't run its own process like, um, like Postgres would run its own process. So if you, only, if you want all of these things, maybe Learn is good for you, but if you only want some of these things, you can do as something that's either simpler or more stable or something. So, because uh, um, I've only been I've only written for like a year ago. Um, so, if, if you just want uh, easy serialization of Python objects that looks like a dictionary, you can use the standard module uh, shell, and it's just kind of works the same way. You say I'm going to open a file name, and then I can put data into it and treat it like a dictionary. Um, I haven't shown you a full example here, but yeah, it's like this. Um, if you just want it to be easy to come up with good file names, consider using Pathlet, which I hadn't heard of until very recently. It's much easier than os.path. Um, here are some ways you can come up with file names with Pathlet, like the slashes, just slashes. Uh, yeah. Um, but then the main thing is if you want a database that doesn't have a server, uh, so to be clear, when I say a database with servers, it's, it's something that's running its own process like Postgres or Mongo. Um, and a database that doesn't have a server might be SQLite or LevelDB. And um, there are reasons to use all these or none of them. And 
Um, one of the considerations is that uh, sometimes it's more work to run another service. And uh, if that's the reason why you want to learn, use Lerm, consider whether one of these others would be better. Um, the main issue with Lerm, or one of the main issues with Lerm, is it's very slow. I mean, not that slow, but in comparison. Because um, every time you write something to it, it's writing to a file. Every time you read it, it's reading from the file. And I didn't try to make it fast. Uh, so if you care about speed, you probably don't want to learn. Um, and it's also only a Python library. It would be pretty easy to write it uh, in another language, but it's, it hasn't been done. So um, these are two big reasons not to use Learn. Um, but if it is exactly what you want, it might be easier, because it's very fine-tuned to work in Python and to be very easy to use. Uh, the, other, the other ones are like designed to be more general. Um, OK, now I'm going to on another brief tangent about the overuse of fancy databases, which doesn't really have anything to do with Learn, but kind of has something to do with Learn. Uh, fancy, complicated, wonderful databases are very wonderful, and there's a reason they exist. Um, but uh, sometimes you don't really need all this power. And if you don't need all this power, it might not be worth the using it, because they're kind of annoying sometimes if you have another service, or like, I just have to understand how it works. And I don't like remembering things, because it's a lot of work. I like to sleep. Um, so. Uh, so I really like files, as I said, and if you can do your thing with just normal files, it's, uh, things can be much easier. Um, if you really need the speed and all the fanciness of a database, you should use a database. I mean, like, like, like Postgres or whatever. Um, and I, I use these, but uh, if, if you're not taking advantage of all these features, the, uh, the annoyingness of, of uh, running it and being within that ecosystem might not be worth it. So I think, uh, um, just an example, let's say Mongo, because I say Mongo because it, a lot of things that people do with Mongo I, uh, are similar to how I use Lerm. It's just really great and fast and you know, all stuff, and it's, it's really, really popular. But I think the reason it's popular is not because it's fast and stuff. It's partly that, it's partly a lot of other things that, one of the things is that it's easy to start using. You just type Mongo and then your database name. And, um, and it, all this together, it contributes to people using Mongo when um, it isn't the best tool for the job. Uh, so it, it sounds like it's a really cool name. Um, it's kind of uh, popular. It's a new thing. So you feel like you should use it because it's like the fancy thing. But files, they've been around for a long time, and they just don't seem like a thing. So if you really need the, the features of it, you should use you should use these cool databases. Otherwise, um, otherwise, uh, files might be just fine and might be uh, easier when you forget how your program works. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, so now. Uh, I've told you um, how Lerm works, how I use it, how it changes how I test and debug, when you should use other things instead. Now I'm going to tell you about some interesting parts of the implementation. And I have about 10 minutes left, is that right? OK. Uh, nine minutes, yeah. Um, so uh, OK, so uh, this is just like cool Python things that I didn't fully, I, I don't know, that seem interesting. So there's a, you can define a call method in Python. Um, when, you, when you run a function, so here's a function, you know, when I put parentheses around a thing and I have an object in the parentheses, the way Python knows what to do is it looks at the call method of f. Um, so uh, this classes also have call methods, um, but I could define my own weird thing, which I don't think I'm going to really fully explain, but I could define my own call method, and then this thing isn't really a function, but it, it can do something. Um, so that's how I, the, the, um, the cache decorator is in fact implemented using this call method. And the cache decorator, in fact, returns a learned object, with, which, is, which has a special call method. So that's how I learned this call method. Another cool thing is uh, I heard of the library, or the module, you know, os.path. Has anyone used os.path? OK. OK, good. I, I was afraid when I only saw a few hands. Yes. Um, yeah, os.path is for composing paths, but in particular, that, that are appropriate for your system. Um, if you want to. All it is is, a, is an alias to one of these three libraries. So if you wanted to test that something's going to work in another system, you can just use the appropriate one of these in your in your tests. Um, yeah. So in my computer, they're the same. Okay. The last cool thing is um, parameterized decorators. The, when I read about decorators first, uh, it all made sense when it was just a decorator like this that doesn't take any arguments. Um, but if it did take arguments, it was like the documentation. I was so confused. But uh, then eventually it sort of made sense to me. It's, all it is is um, a decorator is just a function. OK, this, in case you haven't used decorators, this, this syntax here. It's just a function that takes one function and returns another function. 
So this thing here, decorate uh, with the at, is the same as saying f equals decorate of this f. Uh, it, decorate is a function that takes a function and returns a function. Um, but what if you want to give special parameters? Well, then you just have to define a function that returns a decorator. So you have a function that returns a function that returns a function or something like that. Um, so let's say here I have my meta decorator and I return this result, decorate, and then I decorate my function with decorate. Um, maybe this is you know not making sense. But the point is that that that's the when you have a decorator with parameters, that's all it's doing. It's it's doing something and it's returning a direct decorator, and then you're decorating your function with that. Um, okay, so I told you about. Uh, Sorry, if I, I, I didn't really do justice to the, the parameterized decorators, but yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, but I just want to go on. So uh, I told you how it works, how I use it, how it relates to testing and debugging, some interesting things. Uh, oh, this is in the wrong order, but yeah. So I told you about the call and decorators and something else. Um, uh, then some of the alternatives you might use are shelf. Uh, oh, I didn't mention PickleDB, but that's another thing. Um, pathlib for composing paths. Um, just gonna wait. And yeah, here are some of the, the cool things. Uh, the uh, roadmap for Vlurm, the first thing is Vlurm.cache needs a better name because it's not really a cache. I don't know what to call it. Huh? There's already a built in file because that's oh, It is, but it's. It, there's, the comment was there's already a built in Python function that does something like it, but uh, the, the point is that I want to have things in my file system with the. The convenient names. No, no, but the concept is called memoization. Ah, okay. The concept is called memoization. Uh, yes. So I should call it memoize. Thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, right. Good. Wonderful. Okay, another thing I want to add is exporting to other databases because Varm is very slow. So if you want to do anything interactively with it, which I don't want to do in the context of normal data process, of like a, a batch job that runs every night, but if I want to open it up and play with it for a couple minutes, that would be helpful. Another thing is adding more, making it easier to debug, with probably just adding more error messages. Um, but the main thing is I just want to use Vlurm more. So if you have a project that you think uh, could use some Vlurm, um, I would love to see if I can put it in there and make it useful. Uh, right, yeah. Um, and then uh, also the roadmap for me. Uh, so what did I say here? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I don't actually know where I'm going to sleep tonight. So if, if you have any tips or uh, uh, space on your floor, that would be very welcome. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs>